Today, I'm going to talk about governance as a decision-taking process between public, private, and civil stakeholders within a local community. We took an interest in the dynamic that exists within local communities. Our study revealed that we needed to focus on intangible development factors because there are certain rural communities that are winners while others are lo losers. This is a well-known fact. Tangible development factors such as access to capital funds and natural resources proves to be insufficient when explaining the development of communities. And this is why we need to examine intangible aspects such as local governance. So what do I mean by governance? As I mentioned earlier, governance is the original decision-taking process that involves political, economic, social, and civic actors within a community. Often, when we examine these decisions, we re realize that these are novel institutional arrangements implemented by local actors. I also think we're starting to see a new type of rural govern governance emerge these days, which is the, this novel way of exercising power and taking decisions, which is based on consultations and partnerships. It also showcases three categories of actors, municipality, private economic actors, and community organizations. I apologize for the sound, but I will continue with my presentation. So what has changed? Traditionally, it was the local political and economic powers that took decisions. However, we are now seeing the rise of local civil society and community organizations that are willing and wanting to be heard. This means that political decision takers have no choice but acknowledge these individuals. In other words, this means that you must measure the social acceptability of all projects impacting a community. And when we undertake this approach, we try to identify a common denominator for all three key stakeholders, the local elected officials, economic actors, and the civil society actors. I will now give you a few examples of what I consider to be successful governance. This particular case study is about the small community of St. Francoise located near Rimouski. So a relatively large piggery wanted to set up shop in St. Francoise. There was all sorts of opposition, and when the stakeholders sat down to discuss this project under the leadership of the town mayor, they realized they needed to identify a site for the piggery that would suit everyone, including from an economic and environmental POV. Another example is the Lilac Garden Park of Gardin et Lila in the town of Capaleg as is an ex excellent example of public consultation whereby all the individuals or parties involved agreed to the project. It was a win-win situation for all the parties because the economic actors were satisfied because a garden park, park would attract tourists. The social actors were satisfied because it embellished the town and improved the quality of, the, of life in the town. And finally, the elected officials were happy because they were able to put in place a novel project. Another example is the construction of a wood farm in the regional county municipality of Lower St. Lawrence. There was a lot of opposition at the beginning because people were concerned about the noise, the visual impact, among others. However, through several consultations, the involvement of several local RCM elected officials, the project was able to gain good social acceptability, which is key. We were also conducting other research projects at the time. So for example, the Bell Economy Rural, rural Project with Bell Rimmer funded by the CRH in different rural communities. And we realized that the initiatives rolled out by community actors and voluntary organizations were well received by citizens. You can see here that private interpreter, entrepreneurs had an appreciation rate of 67%. And it's important to note that private entrepreneurs in rural communities usually have family ties or other types of ties to the local community. They aren't foreigners. They aren't large companies. So therefore, it's they, they have an economic impact on the community and create jobs as well. Mayors also have a high appreciation rate, much higher than that of the federal and provincial elected officials. We thus concluded that when elected officials are closer to the people out on the ground, it is more likely that the work they do is appreciated and recognized. 
So now we study this notion of governance and we realize that there are three types of models of governance, regardless of the dynamic I just walked you through. There are two key models. So they are the functional governance model and the citizen or what we call partner-based governance model. I'm not going to provide you with a full description as we are short on time, but we can see, for example, that residents under the functional governance model see themselves as taxpayers, while under a citizen or partner-based governance model, residents see themselves as citizens. Under the functional governance model, the local government delivers services to residents as they are seen as consumers, while under the citizen or partner-based governance model, the local govern government sees itself as an institution that represents civil society. In one case, individuals advocate their rights, and in the other, their duties. So in the end, though, in light of the financial constraints small communities face, amalgamations, privatization, the building of services will be favored, while in the other cases, individuals will seek to put in place partnerships with other municipalities so they can share the burden of certain expenses, such as waste management or the creation of intermunicipal boards. To conclude, we know that initiatives rolled out by volunteer organizations as well received by citizens. And we also know that leading communities have effective governance models. And it is that governance that largely explains the dynamism that exists within these communities. In other words, the development of local economies can be encouraged and fostered by strengthening development capabilities. There are different types of capabilities. For example, we study social capital and of course, local governance. That these are part of the intangible development factors. What does this mean for public policies? We can draw the following conclusion. If we know that the economic prosperity of rural communities depends on local governance capabilities. This means that public policies that are put in place to support local development must first aim at developing social capabilities and not only local economic development as such. I thank you for your attention.